Hello, welcome. Uh, your permission for recording uh, this seminar. I hope that it's okay with all of you. Dionysus, yes, we can start the recording. Thank you. I don't know how useful it is to use my camera because my camera is in the screen, so it is a little bit uh, problematic for me to have it uh, also the camera in uh, my screen. Hope that you can see now the the reminder. Okay. So welcome all. You can see all the people in, in uh, the room. Um, we have uh, a general presentation just for our start. The first international seminar in Greece, educational platform for life cycle analysis of treatments, treatments based on nanoparticles applied to the construction industry. Uh, this is the project title and coordinator is the University of, of uh, Seville. It's uh, an Erasmus Plus project uh, starting in uh, 2022. And here is the presentation of uh, the partners. As I said, coordinator is the University of uh, Seville. Uh, we are the second partner, National Technical University of Athens. Uh, Chalmers uh, Technological University is a third partner. Also, the uh, association, uh, no, it's a, it's a center, technology center of Marmol from Spain. And from Greece, it's Delta Materials and Innovation Solutions uh, company. Yeah, please have uh, you can you can sit here or back. No, it's full. Huh? Um, there are one is here. So uh, let's continue with the general presentation. Nanometric products began to become popular back to 80s uh, in comparison particles in the range from 1 to 100 nanometers. In July 90, one of the first international symposia on nanoscience and nanotechnology was held in Baltimore, United States, where the study of nanomaterials and nanotechnology was formally defined as a sub-area of the basic sciences. The rise of nanomaterials has led to uh, their introduction into various sectors in recent years. One of these is the construction sector, where nanomaterials are often used in the form of additives, coatings, and treatments. Studies in Switzerland and Japan show that nanomaterials uh, of, uh, of the type that you can see in the screen uh, are already present in the construction uh, sector. Despite their presence in various building materials, products containing nanoparticles in their composition and used in the sector are still nice products in Europe and very little information is currently available uh, on them, both in the health and environmental fields. In uh, 2009, the European Union, through the Scientific Committee on Emerging and Newly Identified Health Risks, claimed to have demonstrated the health, health and environmental hazards of several manufactured nanomaterials. The existence of an emerging risk has made the implementation of actions related to nanotechnologies with an integrated, safe, and responsible approach, a central element of EU policy. Uh, to address the environmental aspect and to try to make the construction sector more sustainable, this project proposes to promote the use of uh, LCA, life cycle assessment, methodology in nanoparticulated products among professionals in the sector so that they are able to select the nanoproducts that will provide the best performance to the construction material, but always with a sustainable point of view and minimizing the environmental impact generated by the construction uh, sector. Training the future agents of change by making use of an open educational resource platform created by the par partners from the different EU countries containing innovative, cross-cutting and international knowledge in which the rest of the EU partner countries can also make their contributions if they, if they so wish, is a necessary uh, change. Um, 
equipment students with the knowledge will in the near future improve some environmental aspects of construction making their contribution to trying to meet the target set by eu in the 2030 climate target plan mainly with the training of personnel to carry out green jobs now the objectives of the project of the nano air the nano air project will contribute to provide nano product manufacturers construction sector professionals and environmental managers with the knowledge necessary to understand the environmental and health impacts generated by the manufacturing application and disposal processes of the most frequently used nano products in the construction sector in order to contribute contribute to the above the objectives of the nano air are as following personal and professional development of professionals related to the subject matter of the project awareness of the importance of the environmental impact of nanotechnological products integration of the innovative curriculum created by in the nano air project in the curricula of universities to introduce knowledges in lca of nanotechnological products for the professions of the future and creation of quality material freely available online that can be used for self-training. The target groups of the nano air are people in the construction and nanotechnology sectors at public and private level, low, medium and high skilled who need to improve their skills for professional growth and to have more chances to find a new job and to keep theirs. SMEs with the construction sector wishing to improve their competitiveness. Job centers dealing with skills upgrading and active labor market policies. Policy and decision makers responsible for the definition and implementation of local and regional employment and labor market policies. And finally, researchers from national and international research organizations and other universities dealing with energy issues. Uh, also, it was not finally. Students from universities, uh, public bodies, engineering and architecture companies, nanotechnology companies and uh, environmental managers. Schematically, you can see how it can work with nano LCA at buildings. And this is a short uh, in work packages terms uh, structure of the nano air uh, we have five work packages the one is devoted to project management then is work package two that is in, in establishment of common learning outcomes on the calculation of lca of building materials with nano products um, work package three e-guideline for lca calculation methodology for nano products Nano Air Interactive uh, flashcards and finally work package five Nano Air Open Educational uh, Resource. Here is just to have an idea where we are. Uh, it's a two years long project and we are in uh, the second year right now. Uh, all work packages uh, are, uh, are running. Uh, and here is uh, some general um, information about uh, all work packages here is the work package two on the establishment of common learning outcomes on the calculation of L uh, lca here we have the comparative study of the uh, curricular focus on lca in greece and provision of data from nanomaterial synthesis for building lc uh, inventories in work package three we have the study on the normative of LCA of building materials in Greece, analysis of scientific papers on the environmental impact of nanoproducts. Uh, one case is the carbon nanotubes, analysis of scientific papers on LCA applied to building materials. In work package four, uh, four basic families of um, uh, nanomaterials uh, of this um, category using in construction I mean and finally uh, the nano air open educational resource the main results of the project are quality educational material about calculation of lca of nano products in construction materials that contributes to the education 
and preparation of future agents of chance change uh, for green uh, jobs. A comparison of European and national information about LCA and nanomaterials, transversal and innovative uh, HE curricula and E guideline uh, on the curricula, five interact interactive flashcards on the environmental impact of nano products and easily accessible and free OR in the, uh, with the contents uh, of the nano air project. Um, a, a very short uh, presentation of uh, our lab, uh, our nano lab here in National Technical University uh, uh, of Athens. Uh, you can see here um, the uh, different areas that we are involved, uh, recycling, carbon-based materials, um, of course, characterization, thermoplastics, uh, energy building, building materials, uh, safety, and also a horizontal issue is ethics and research integrity. Uh, some projects that um, are related with, uh, with uh, the nature of the nano air project is the iClima build that is a uh, functional and advanced insulating and energy harvesting storage materials across climate adaptive building envelopes. The light coke building an ecosystem for the upscaling of lightweight multifunctional concrete and ceramic materials and structures. Uh, Lorcanis uh, already uh, done uh, several years ago, long lasting reinforced concrete for energy infrastructure, other severe operating conditions, and Innova concrete, uh, innovative materials and techniques for the con conservation of a uh, 20th century concrete based cultural uh, heritage. Here you can see several of the materials synthesized um, for various applications, including the building sector in um, our lab, uh, ranging from hybrid to subs to carbon fibers, graphene, CNTs, uh, CNT carpets, corsel, uh, also hybrid CNTs, mesoporous silica, metal oxide nanoparticles and magnetic nanoparticles. And uh, some uh, really interesting case is uh, this uh, that is from one of uh, the papers of the colleagues in uh, in our lab is a holistic environmental impact assessment of carbon nanotube growth uh, through chemical vapor deposition CVD uh, method that is uh, mainly used in uh, our uh, lab as a main process for uh, CV for uh, CNT uh, CNTs um, structures. And another one is uh, very interesting that uh, uh, our colleague, uh, my colleague in, in uh, the lab have uh, uh, developed is a testing novel Portland uh, cement formulations with carbon nanotubes and intrinsic properties relation, nano indentation analysis with machine learning on a microstructure identification. In my opinion, one of my favorite um, uh, papers in the lab and also uh, we have the pore and phase identification through nano indentation mapping and microcomputer tomography in nano enhanced cement, study of cement nanocomposites with nanomaterials, actually carbon nanotubes, phase identification with nano indentation technique and microcomputing tomography and um, image analysis. Uh, all uh, pictures are uh, taken as the previous one from. Um, uh, papers done with uh, several uh, partners and also members of the uh, and some members of uh, my team. I think that this is the, the presentation. I would like to thank, first of all, to, uh, to thank very much all the partners of the Nano Air. Uh, I think that all of them are attending the, the seminar and also to thank you very much uh, all uh, my team members uh, assisting today for the seminar, and especially Kate. Uh, Kate uh, would like to be with us for sure, but she is um, uh, she is uh, from uh, home. Kate, thank you very much, all of us, and uh, we hope the best. Thank you too, and wish you all the best for uh, for the seminar today. So I will be available to answer questions in the chat if there are for the presenters. Thank you very much. Yes, please.
thank you very please. much, Professor Karatidis. Any question, please, from the audience? I think we don't. The point is is always the first, the first one. So then we can move on. Okay. So we can move on with uh, the next presentation by Dr. Dimitris uh, Dragatovarnis for the main uh, project products and results. Dr. Dimitris uh, Dragatoyanis is an applied mathematician and has acquired the master degree in material science and technology at PhD in experimental nanomechanics. He is an extensive background in project management and R&D of advanced materials and structures. He is managing director of Delta MPIS, an innovation driving SME established in the technological part of Lethkipos in Democritus focused on uh, implementing digital and cutting-edge technology solutions to work optimally engineered products and services. Dimitri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Haritidis, uh, for organizing this uh, very important first international seminar in Greece of Nanoair project. Uh, thank you very much also to the other presenters and all of you for attending today's meeting. And of course, the rest of the project partners for their help and their great work for making this uh, uh, project uh, to be uh, in a very good progress. Um, Nanoair project uh, is organized in uh, five work packages. Uh, first work package is related to project management. Uh, regarding work package two, the main outcome is the uh, common European course on calculation of LCA of building products with nano products and uh, innovative uh, course, uh, which aim to train uh, students. And we're happy that we have many students today with us uh, to new green jobs. Uh, towards this, we have worked a lot. Uh, we have uh, uh, made the comparison of uh, the various LCA curricula and uh, various uh, curricula focused on nanoparticle, nanoparticulate products in the construction sector existing in the participating countries, uh, which uh, will help us to lay the foundations of the innovative um, uh, course. Uh, we have also defined the learning objectives and the learning outcomes uh, of uh, this course uh, along with the goals uh, to be achieved. Uh, we have taken into account the uh, analysis of the needs of the market and as well, a literature review has been uh, conducted. Uh, the um, pedagogical experts of uh, NanoAir are in charge of determining the most appropriate uh, learning methodology for calculation LCA applied to nano products. Uh, uh, we have also uh, taken into account the capacity of the centers, of the educational centers, uh, uh, in respect to human and uh, technological resources, and we are going to adapt this course uh, um, in respect to their needs. So, thanks to all these activities, uh, the innovative, uh, uh, this innovative course will be uh, created. 
the needs for further education in respect to LCA, um, uh, the need for further education is driven mainly by three factors. Higher education readies industry professionals for real life situations. Uh, LCA integration fuels sustainable innovation. Uh, and all this in a multidisciplinary approach uh, by merging environmental engineering and economics for sustainability. But what about uh, education of nanomaterials in construction? Uh, we can say that um, in respect to the market, uh, few construction products uh, use uh, nanoparticles currently. However, uh, nano uh, products offer several advantages, uh, which is likely to suit to in use increasing demand for knowledge. Uh, in the education, there is a, a gap since limited courses focus specifically on nanoparticles, and there is a development need since lack of courses due to the innovative nature uh, underscoring nanotechnology's growing role. Universities degree lack nanoparticle related subject, while professional associations offer specific training. So there is a call in order to foster innovation and sustainability, broader academic and professional sectors need nanoparticle related education. Uh, a survey was created um, uh, in the participating countries from uh, and circulated from the partners in each country. Um, this is the participant profile, a majority aged between 40 and 60, uh, holding doctorate degrees and with extensive teaching experience. Half of them teach architecture, mostly at universities with limited online teaching experience. We asked them about their experience in respect to life cycle assessment of products with nanoparticles used in the construction sector. They answered us that they have limited familiarity with nanoproduct life cycle assessment calculations. They have familiarity with nanoproducts in construction, but fewer have LCA calculation expertise. Few training centers offer nanoproduct specific training, particularly in construction applications. And what are their suggestions? There is a strong desire to include LCA calculation of nanoproducts in construction education, especially at the master's level, Emphasis on necessity for nano project, project products due to the evident lack of training in this area. Also, we have worked a lot towards um, shaping this common course. This is work on progress. I can tell you that there are 10 units uh, of this course, starting from the first part, which has to do with introduction to basic concepts and introduction to life cycle analysis. Next is uh, the normative frame of LCA and LCA methodology. The next part has to do with advanced materials, introduction to nanotechnology and nanoproducts in building materials. And last one is environmental issues, uh, the development of LCA of a nanoparticle composed product environmental product declarations for construction products with nanoparticles, and last one, uh, interpretation of LCA results and comparability. A critical point is the analysis regarding the regulations uh, in respect to LCA of building materials and in respect to nanoproducts existing in uh, participating countries. Moreover, we have made uh, a detailed review in respect to environmental impact of nanoproducts and in respect to LCA applied to building materials. All this will be used, uh, all this analysis within Work Package 3 will be used uh, in order to um, um, uh, improve uh, the training methodology that is to be developed within this project. Some points that I can, uh, let's say, highlight is that there is a lack of standardization. 
Uh, regarding tool usage and results, informatic tools are commonly used in LCAs and open source software may enhance data sharing and knowledge building, potentially align future results. There is limited endpoint analysis, less than half of the studies analyze endpoint impact categories due to a lack of consensus on assessment methods, leading to inconsistencies in processes. Disparity impact categories, varying focus on impact categories across studies contributes to inconsistency, hampering a full understanding of nanoparticles impact. And last, system boundaries, studies often limit their scope to cradle to gate analysis, missing crucial new stages vital for evaluating nanoparticle materials sustainability for construction. In addition to the above, uh, an important uh, uh, point is the um, innovative, uh, the interactive flashcards uh, that uh, will aid in conveying the scope of our work. They will provide critical information about LCA of nanoproducts and uh, as well uh, will um, present the main uh, nanomaterials that are applied in construction se sector. Uh, these are, in the slide, you can see the, the five flashcards that we have prepared. Um, the first one is about LCA methodology for nanoproducts in construction sector, and the other has to do with the application of um, uh, the most important nanomaterials, taking into account health and environmental perspective. Last one is the Open Educational Resource, or OER, um, which is very important for teaching and learning uh, activities. It's a digital material that it is friendly for the user, easy to use and share, and will be very important for academic reasons and educational and vocational training. Uh, my last slide is about um, the website of the project, which is already online. Um, the results uh, are uh, in this um, layout. Uh, we can see uh, that here the project will, be, uh, will update in the four uh, language of the project, the results, uh, and anyone can find material uh, in respect to the results of, uh, of the project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Dr. Dragatoyanis, any questions? Maybe later. Maybe later. Maybe with, you can come up with something later. With our speakers. Okay, and now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Dr. Kanelopoulou, uh, Irene, uh, is a chemist graduated from the Aristotle University of um, Thessaloniki and has acquired the master's degree in material science and technology here in National Technical University. She is member of the Material Science and Engineering Department, supporting laboratory exercises, courses, and thesis, uh, as well as the administration of the uh, interdisciplinary postgraduate program, Material Science and Technology. And thank you so much for this. Also, she is um, you are PhD holder, as I remember. Uh, her recent research interest focuses on the synthesis and characterization of hybrid nanoparticles. More specifically, she works on the synthesis of organic core in organic cell nanoparticles, their characterization and use as add mixtures in cementitious matrices aiming um, in the enhancement of the self-sealing healing behavior of the latter. Uh, Irini, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Haritavis. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for organizing this seminar. Uh, from my part, I will be presenting uh, some of the concluded or ongoing research of the R Nano Lab concerning 
nanomaterials uh, for cementitious based uh, composites. We will start with the motivation of similar studies and some key aspects of the incorporation of uh, nanomaterials in cementitious composites. And then we will focus on sub CNTs and uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles when they are incorporated in cement. To begin with, uh, we can see from a literature review that many different nanoparticles are incorporated in uh, cementitious materials to create composites with tailored uh, properties and improved uh, performances. These nanoparticles may be inorganic, metals or metal oxides, organic, mainly polymeric uh, nanoparticles, or carbon-based, uh, the famous fullerens, graphenes, and uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, more specifically, you can see some of the nanoparticles that are examined in the construction uh, sector, nanosilica, nanoclay, uh, carbon nanotubes, multiwall CNTs, etc. All with the aim to improve the chemical and mechanical properties of cement, so as uh, to attribute uh, economical, environmental and uh, social benefits to the society by forming spars multifunctional concrete with enhanced mechanical properties, self-healing, self-curing, self-sensing properties, and finally, uh, to ensure sustainability, safety, and cost efficiency in the structure uh, sector. Uh, as far as self-healing and self-curing is concerned, we will discuss in this presentation about the incorporation of subs, nano-sized uh, subs that were incorporated in cementitious matrices to enhance uh, the self-healing behavior. Uh, according to, uh, as far as self-sensing is concerned, uh, we will see some research uh, done with uh, carbon nanotubes incorporated in cementitious uh, composites. And, the, and then we will see how all these nanoparticles and some zinc oxide nanoparticles can influence the mechanical properties uh, of the structures all with the aim to create a new generation, tailored, multifunctional, and uh, long-lasting concrete. To begin with uh, SAPS, uh, in research that was uh, concluded in our nanolab, hybrid nanoparticles comprising uh, an organic polymeric core uh, that was encapsulated in an inorganic cell were incorporated in the cement uh, via dry mixing, then uh, the cement paste was molded and after 24 hours it was unmolded and it was left for aging and curing for 28 uh, days according to British Standard 196. After the 20 day, 28 days, the microstructure of the composite was uh, characterized by a SEM, micro CT, microcomputer tomography and optical microscopy. Uh, the mechanical properties were evaluated in terms of flexural and compressive strength, and in a different set of uh, specimens, cracks were artificially induced, and then the self-healing of these cracks was evaluated via micro -CT. In this slide, uh, you can see the proposed synthesis uh, process and the proposed chemical mechanisms for the synthesis of these hybrid subs that were incorporated in the cement. Uh, the flexural and compressive strength uh, were evaluated uh, according to BS196. We can see uh, that both flexural and compressive strength uh, actually remained intact, which is a favorable outcome because uh, sometimes when nanoparticles are incorporated in cement, the mechanical properties uh, deteriorate because of poor dispersion mainly. So if uh, we keep uh, the mechanical properties intact, it's a favorable outcome. As far as the microstructure and porosity is concerned, uh, it was evaluated via micro CT. Uh, we can see that when subs were incorporated in a cementitious matrix in concentration 1 and 2% by weight of cement, for both cases, we had uh, a reduction of the total porosity in comparison with uh, reference samples. So this means that uh, we uh, managed to make more dense uh, structures that uh, will be less permeable to unfavorable parameters for the, from the environment. And uh, maybe we can uh, succeed to have uh, enhanced mechanical properties in the future. And as far as the self-healing curing of uh, cementitious matrices when they are cracked, 
They were evaluated uh, via micro CT through a protocol that was uh, developed in house in our NABO lab. Uh, the first level of evaluation concerns the optical characterization of the artificially cracked uh, specimens. The second level of uh, the assessment of the self healing capacity concerns uh, the deduction of uh, some uh, uh, parameters, the percent object volume and the connectivity density that were deducted from the 3D imaging of the specimens via mathematical algorithms uh, using the micro CT, which shows the connectivity density as a more sensitive architectural parameter of the structure of the composites, of the cementitious composites, uh, namely the reduction of the connectivity density value uh, correlates to the progress of the self-healing of the cracks. So an empirical index uh, was drawn in order to have a qualitative uh, assessment of the progress of the self-healing and we can see that the case of the incorporation of 1% by weight of cement uh, subs in mortar came out as the most uh, promising one. So overall, in means of crack self-healing, we can say that the target of the sustainability in construction was achieved. Moving on, we will discuss about some cases of self-sensing concrete that have been tested in our nanolab by the incorporation of uh, carbonaceous uh, materials in the cementitious matrices, and more specifically by the incorporation of CNTs. As you all uh, are familiar, as you are all aware, the carbon nanotubes are considered as one-dimensional structures. They have a high aspect ratio, ranging from 1,000 to 10,000, and they can conduct a very high current density from 10 to the 6th power up to 2.4 times 10 to the 8th power amperes per square centimeters. CNTs generally have very high strength, toughness, Young's modulus because of the very strong uh, sp2 carbon-carbon bonding. In this step uh, picture, we present uh, the crack bridging effect when CNTs are incorporated in cementitious uh, matrices. Uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, CSH hydration phases at the top and bottom of this picture. And in between, there is a crack with multi-wall carbon nanotubes that have been pulled out. This is something inevitable because of the great difference between the tensile strength of the multi-wall carbon nanotubes and the cementitious matrix. So if a crack is formed, then inevitably the multi-wall carbon nanotubes will be pulled out of the matrix, uh, succeeding to have a bridging effect between uh, the two different uh, CSH uh, phases. Now, if we, uh, if we compare carbon nanotubes to steel, then uh, we will see that even though the density of uh, CNTs is uh, much lower, approximately one-sixth of the steel, then the tensile strength is estimated around 100 uh, times greater, higher than that of steel, while the Young's modulus is, uh, and the fracture strain are also uh, a lot higher for the CNTs compared to the steel. In this uh, slide, you can see structures that are, are capable of self-sensing under reverse cyclic load and damage. You can see that in the bridge, for example, uh, there are different uh, spots where uh, self-sensing cementitious materials are placed and they can uh, transmit uh, wireless signals to sites that gather information regarding crack propagation and damage accumulation so you can have very useful insight uh, for the damage uh, that has happened to any structure so as to act proactive and avoid any uh, structure deterioration. The same goes for the pipe that you see that is built underground and under the sea and so on. So self-sensing in uh, structures is very important. Now, as for the synthesis of CNTs, uh, this comprises a thermal decomposition of a carbon precursor. Uh, usually it is a gas such as acetylene or methane. And then there is absorption, pre precipitation, and initiation of growth on the surface of catalytic uh, particles. So the critical parameters in this synthesis is the temperature, the precursor, the substrate, and the catalyst chosen. And uh, according to different um, schemas of synthesis, we can uh, get uh, different morphologies of CNTs 
who can get entangled CNTs or, uh, or aligned CNTs or even CNFs. Now, when CNTs are incorporated in cementitious matrices, uh, as uh, in the case of all nanomaterials, it is very crucial to estimate, to evaluate the dispersion of uh, CNTs in the cementitious uh, matrix. For different dosages of uh, CNTs in the cementitious uh, composite, so, uh, we have uh, the evaluation via scanning electron microscopy, so we can evaluate on the surface of the specimens whether the CNTs are uniformly uh, dispersed or if uh, we have aggregates or if we have a hydration product products developed on the CNTs, something that we can see from the EDS analysis that takes place uh, with uh, the scanning electron microscopy. Now, uh, during the mechanical integrity uh, tests uh, that we had in, this, uh, in these experiments, we saw once again that the compressive strength uh, was actually not, uh, the, we didn't have an impact on the compressive strength, which was uh, a, a nice outcome. And then, according to the electrochemical impedance uh, spectroscopy, when uh, we checked for composites with different dosages of CNTs, as you can see, uh, we concluded that the resistance of the composites of the CNT cement composites decreases with the increment of the CNT concentration. On the next slide, you can see the electrochemical model that is proposed according to the fitting of the measured impedance spectra into the parameter R2. The parameter R2 corresponds to the resistance of the charge transfer on the CNT's surface. And the fact that the R2 values decrease when CNT's are incorporated in the cementitious matrix in comparison to the reference uh, uh, specimen is indicative of the creation of a conductive percolation path so uh, it is indicative of the self-sensing properties that uh, are induced in the cementitious composite. Moving on to the zinc oxide nanoparticles, it's uh, a research that is ongoing at this uh, moment. The generally, nano-sized uh, metal oxides are incorporated in uh, cementitious uh, composites because they enhance uh, mechanical properties uh, due to thickening the microstructure by accelerating the cement bonding process and improving the internal transition zone between aggregates and cement. More specifically, of all metal oxides, the zinc oxide nanoparticles have gained a lot of interest because of their universality, their low cost, their durability and their non-toxicity. But the mechanism that they work when they are incorporated in the cementitious materials is as described above as generally for all the metal oxides which are nano-sized. In these slides, uh, we propose the way uh, that these nanoparticles are incorporated uh, in the um, uh, in the cement paste. It's not a dry mixing procedure, this one, because the admixture is added in the water. And then we can see, uh, according to literature, some results about the mechanical properties of the cementitious uh, composites. We can see that the compressive strength, which is the key strength when we refer to the cementitious composites, uh, are improved when zinc oxide nanoparticles are incorporated in the cementitious matrix. Uh, the best uh, results come at uh, 28 days of curing because uh, in this research uh, they measured the mechanical properties uh, during the first day, the seventh, and the 28th day uh, of curing. The best results came out for the 28th day of curing. Uh, as uh, we said in the beginning, the reason for this improvement is because uh, these nanoparticles uh, have a filler effect. They fill in the voids that uh, are usually uh, uh, filled with water, so we, uh, we end up with more dense uh, structures. This can also be uh, concluded by the same photographs. A photograph refers to a reference specimen, while B and C same photographs uh, correspond to specimens where zinc oxide nanoparticles are incorporated. We can see that in the case of the B uh, picture, we have more uh, CSH hydration products, more CSH gels that make the structure denser. 
While in uh, picture C, we can distinguish more intricate uh, structures, which are needle-like structures, and they cross-link uh, the whole uh, composite. Zinc oxide nanoparticles can be produced with many different techniques. Uh, currently, we are uh, gathering information and we, uh, we are trying to uh, compare the results, the formulation results in a morphological aspect uh, when these uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles are synthesized via the sol gel technique uh, by the process and the mechanisms uh, described in this slide with uh, the same nanoparticles that are synthesized via the hydrothermal technique uh, by the process and the mechanism also described in this slide. Now, according to the different techniques, we can, we can uh, obtain uh, very different uh, morphologies, nanorods, uh, nanoflowers, nanospheres, uh, which have uh, very different uh, properties that could be useful in different fields of applications. We can see here the different morphologies. Uh, which uh, correspond to different crystallinities and different structures. Uh, just as, um, as an example, we show you an indicative XRD diagram and the corresponding SEM pictures for zinc oxide nanoparticles that uh, were synthesized by the hydrothermal method. You can see that the morphology here is uh, nanoflowers. And uh, with these three different SEM pictures, uh, you can see uh, zinc oxide in the nanoflowers and nanosphere forms. The first two pictures correspond to zinc oxide nanoparticles uh, produced uh, by hydrothermal method, while the last one corresponds to the sol gel technique. So, uh, to wrap it up, the main goal of uh, incorporating nanoparticles is the sustainable development in the field of uh, uh, structure sector, and we can say that this is achieved via the excellent structural performance and the improved safety and uh, reliability of the structures. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irini. Uh, questions now? Yes. So, I want to ask about. Is it? We don't have a microphone. Uh, I don't know if people. Okay, the problem is it's not inside. I it's think that you can push the button on the microphone on the table. Yes. And every, they can. Please move it close to you. Is it red? Push it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, think it's I want to ask about the carbon nanotubes. Are they inserted uniformly, or, or can they be, can they be inserted uh, at the specific direction so the uh, cement has uh, enhanced properties as for its strength in the preferred direction? Uh, usually, the carbon nanotubes uh, cannot be applied uh, like fibers in an oriented, um, uh, explicitly oriented way. What we are trying to succeed is the uniform uh, uh, dispersion of the CNTs uh, in the cementitious matrix. I don't know if I answered, if you cannot uh, actually see hmm? how they will be applied. Could you please close the microphone? Can you please turn the microphone off? Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. Is it possible to hold a specific electric field? Yeah, the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy that uh, is done after the, um, the carbon nanotubes are dispersed in the cementitious matrix and the specimens are formed. So you can see if there is a percolation, if uh, there is a, a conductive road that is, um, uh, that is developed. So if you have aggregates, then you will not have a, you will not have a conductive uh, path. If, they are, uh, if the dispersion is, uh, um, is adequate, then this will be dispersed in the whole volume of the specimen and you uh, will have a conductive path. Thank you. 
Emilius. Emilius. Yes. Uh, congratulations. I, I find uh, your job very interesting, although I, I have not uh, experienced very on this subject. Just I, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, if you we want to determine the volume fraction of the weight fraction, the uh, nanomaterials used in the experiments, which is the method? Well, if I want to determine, yes, if we want to determine the volume fraction or weight fraction of the nanotubes, okay. nanomaterials uh, used in the construction of these uh, specimens, which is the method which can be applied? Uh, I'm sorry, just to get uh, your question right, you mean what's the the best uh, dosage to use? Uh, in order to have the functionalities that I wish. Oh. That's your, that, your question applies to that? Did I yes, if, if, there, if there is something... Is there... okay. Usually we have uh, small dosages of these uh, nanomaterials. Yes. And we try to have the smallest dosage possible in order to have the functionality that we wish. Because if we have big dosages, then yes. we surely have aggregates, mm -hmm. and we don't want that. And moreover, we will have very high cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we try to keep it to the minimum, and that's a trial and error, more or less. Yes. We are trying uh, after the characterization, the full characterization of the mechanical properties and of the property of interest, we decide which is the best, but always keeping in mind to have it to keep it low. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, a short question from me. Uh, how how uh, LCA could act as a tool um, in order to uh, be considered before the synthesis as a design tool? I mean, uh, before we proceed with the synthesis, to proceed with uh, uh, some input from LCA in order to uh, have a different starting point. Yes, uh, we could uh, check for greener uh, methodologies for the synthesis. What will be the benefit? Yeah, uh, the benefit would be greener technologies for the synthesis. Uh, I think uh, with uh, the dosages, we could see the outcome and how we could um, uh, use uh, the scrap after after the service life of the structure, maybe. That's mm -hmm. what I can think. That's how we can connect that. Okay, to be honest, we have the next uh, two uh, invited speakers uh, that are from uh, LCA uh, field that could answer also on, on, on this, but uh, it, it is a very useful uh, tool it has been proved uh, through the projects um, to the design of uh, experiments because uh, just as a comment, trial and error is a very expensive yeah. sport uh, and risky. So we have all the good reasons to move on new uh, considerations about uh, uh, design of experiments and implementation of experiments. Uh, okay, Irene, thank you so much. Thank you. So we can move on to... Uh, the next one, the next is Anestis, uh, Professor Anestis, uh, uh, Anestis Blisidis, Assistant Professor in uh, uh, our School Chemical Engineering in uh, NTUA in uh, the Department of Synthesis and Development of Industrial Processes. Um, Anesis delivers lectures in our lab in several semesters. He has courses on environmental engineering, industrial waste management, environmental assessment, and optimization of industrial processes, and environmental biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Professor Lissidis uh, has introduced the life cycle analysis in the Bob lectures, and he will share his insights on the chemical engineering curriculum. So, Anestis, give us a presentation of what we are doing here. I'll try my best. Uh, I also have this laser that uh, it can help me give the slides uh, as good as possible. Uh, initially, I would like to thank Professor Karakidis, the Air Nano Group, and uh, my apologies to Katie that I sent my slides half an hour before the seminar. 
Uh, I apologize for this. I wish I had a presentation to connect nanomaterials and nanoparticles with LCA, but I don't. To be honest, I have a final slide that we can talk about it and try to, to see the problems and connect this uh, dynamic research uh, fields, fields of research. Right, so my talk is going to be about the course that I'm teaching in the School of Chemical Engineering here at uh, NTUA and uh, try to give you all these uh, bits and bytes that we do here in, in the school. Some general information about the course, it has this long name. We would like to shorten, shorten it. So it has environmental assessment, which is good, but it has also optimization. And there is a, a small part of it that we try to connect optimization with LCA. However, the course is only for eight weeks, so it's impossible to connect uh, this both, uh, both of these aspects. The Greek title, uh, it's uh, on the 9th of September, so it's nearly at the end of the courses. Actually, you are chemical engineers, uh, you are students of the chemical engineers, so I'm advertising actually this course right now. You can uh, have more info at the web pages here. And this is not a mandatory course, unfortunately. It can be, as in many uh, universities around Europe and abroad uh, and outside Europe. However, uh, for the moment, it's uh, at the direction of environment. Let's move forward. That's the team. Professor Kokosis is the coordinator. Uh, beside myself, of course, we have also uh, laboratory and teaching staff, Dr. Kulas, Karaoglanoglu, Nikola Kopoulos, and Psiha, that uh, help with the lab. The scope of the course is that uh, at the end of the course, the students will be familiarized with the terms of sustainability and more general impacts on society. We try to give uh, the alphabet, the basics of, of LCA. So, because we don't have much time, we don't go further into the details and uh, to advanced aspects like linking nanotechnology and nanomaterials with LCA. But maybe in future years, we can also have a small bit of that. The methodology, uh, the methodological framework uh, we based on the ISO methodological framework. We will talk about it in the next slide. And finally, we have some uh, demonstration of optimization applications in order to minimize water and uh, minimize waste water inside the industry and then get new designs that we can go back to our LCI model and model it again, optimize it actually. Right. Now, uh, the first thing to do is to move from the conventional approach, the gate-to-gate approach, the approach that chemical engineers uh, learn throughout this uh, school. The gate-to-gate -gate approach is that we try to optimize yields, we try to minimize energy, we try to minimize byproducts. However, in this course, we try to introduce a holistic approach. Uh, we concern about the raw materials that we use, how these raw materials have been produced, and we are concerned about after the gate of the plant. What is the use of these materials and what is the disposal of these materials? So this is the holistic approach, which is not something very easy uh, because chemical engineer students and generally chemical engineers focus only in this process, in this manufacturing stage. However, we need the holistic approach in life cycle. And this is something that very interesting that we will discuss for nanomaterials at the end. The course content, we are trying to do this, all these seven aspects. Uh, the first three or four points actually are the ISO methodologies that we're going to see in the next slide. 
We have a couple of lectures with advanced uh, matters, uh, but usually we're trying to focus on un uh, uncertainty analysis, sensitivity analysis, uncertainty analysis, and perspective essay. That I think uh, one of the uh, next lectures is going to be about this. Next talks. Uh, here's the program. It's in Greek, but uh, don't worry about it. I will explain to you. On the Greek column, we have the lectures. On the yellow column, we have the labs. Yes, we do have labs. We have courses in the PC lab here, and we uh, introduce uh, to the students to, to new to two of uh, LCA softwares. So, uh, as I, I as I told you earlier. The course is based on the ISO methodology that you can see here on the left side of your screen. We have the goal and scope. We need to introduce our goal. We need to clarify our goal. We need the scope to set the functional unit, uh, the functions, and then the functional unit of our process, our product, our emerging technologies. And we need to set the system boundaries. Is it going to be? Is it going to be from cradle from the start to gate to gate of the plant, or is it going to be a holistic approach? Hopefully, the second one. The second stage is the life cycle inventory. Here we collect all the data. Uh, we give some information on how to collect the data, what quality uh, data we need in order to to perform. Uh, the third step, and in order to uh, to to, uh, to avoid garbage in, garbage out uh, situations. The third step is the life cycle impact assessment. Uh, here we calculate the impacts of our processes, our technologies, our products, and the interpretation of the results. We do have some room here, as as I told you, for advanced aspects. And here we might introduce uh, and try to connect nanotechnology aspects with LCA in the future. Also, students have an assignment, a semester assignment. So we do have uh, two, uh, uh, two or three lectures. The, the students should give presentations regarding their progress of their assignment. Here's the software that we use, the LCA softwares. Uh, we have uh, CCAL. It's an open uh, software. We introduced it because it was uh, developed from the University of Manchester, and both me and Professor Koposis passed from this university, so we were familiar with this software. And uh, it's an open software. It's uh, outdated. It doesn't have the most uh, recent databases, but still the students can get the idea of using an NCA software. Of course, apart from this, we also present the CIMA Pro, uh, which is one of the two or one of the three LCA official NCA softwares that most of the uh, LCA research groups uh, use at the moment. What's next? Uh, the CCALC uh, interface. It includes all the LC, LC stages, the raw material acquisition, the manufacturing process, the use stage, and the wastewater, the, the waste management stage. It has a friendly interface. You can have, you can put your functional unit. Uh, you can have uh, what else is important here. You can have multiple production stages up to 10 stages where you can get into each one of these states and put your life cycle inventory. The inventory that you have collected for, for each stage, you put them here in order to get your uh, impact assessment. Right. Some examples regarding CCAC, you will not see any nanomaterials or nanoparticles here, unfortunately. Uh, production of biodiesel from the atrophic plant, production of polylactic acid from wind, applying LCA to household appliance. Here we can have some nanomaterials and uh, nanoparticles, uh, 
assess the environmental benefit in the case of beer production process and production of beer, beer and bioplastic from bio-based raw materials. All these uh, are examples implemented in the PC lab in order to, to get a good idea, the students to get a, a very good idea of how to implement the CCALC soft software for their assignment. So, uh, we discussed with uh, Professor Kokosis what uh, the assignment is going to be, and we decided to take the process design assignments that students have uh, from the seventh and eighth semester and implement an NCA from these uh, assignments. I think most of uh, the people here are familiar with these process design assignments. So some uh, you can you can see a list of the assignments from the previous year, and in uh, in this case, we are avoiding the most time-consuming state in NCA, which is the life cycle inventory to collect the data. So we have ready we have already the data here. Uh, of course, we need to modify them a little bit to adapt them to the functional unit, uh, to the allocation, etc. We'll see some slides later on. But still, uh, students focus on the goal, focus on the life cycle impact assessment, and not so much on the inventory. We had a lot of uh, examples, LCA examples try to connect the life cycle thinking with uh, the life cycle inventory and then the life cycle impact assessment. One of these examples is the real or artificial or fake Christmas tree. Uh, again, even in uh, single uh, products, you can see that behind this there are hundreds of uh, processes, hundreds, not hundreds of processes, a lot of processes, hundreds of data that someone needs to collect in order to implement a cradle to grade analysis. So we get the life cycle from the life cycle thinking, we get the system boundaries, the boundaries that we want to uh, include into our processes. And then officially we can see uh, in, uh, let's say in blue color, all the processes that we need in order to get one Christmas tree and in uh, yellow boxes, all the inputs that we need pro, uh, in order to implement these processes. Apart from uh, the product, we also can have some byproducts and this is also something that we need to deal with the multifunctionality. Of course, uh, we also have uh, results and uh, we analyze these results from uh, these examples. This is the Christmas, uh, Christmas tree example. Uh, when we look at uh, climate change, the real tree contributes significantly less CO2 equivalent, 60% than the fake one. Is this true? I don't know. It depends. Uh, it depends on two things. Tree cultivation has positive effects on climate change. Question mark, we need to question everything. Uh, have we put inside the, the analysis the land use change? What was the use of the field that we have the Christmas tree before that? Uh, and then of course we need, uh, we learn how to implement sensitivity analysis in order to see if we prolong the use phase of the artificial tree, if it's gonna be better or not from the real Christmas tree. And this is for many examples that we, we have introduced in the course. Regarding the second uh, stage, the life cycle inventory, we need to undergo to all these uh, steps, step by step in order to connect the goal and scope from uh, our study to a completed, it completed inventory and go to the next stage, which is life cycle impact assessment. Here, there are two important aspects. One of them is to relate the data to unit process and functional unit and see how we will tack, tackle 
the multifunctionality if we have a multifunctionality. And uh, talking for a multifunctionality system, here we have not only one product, not only one function, we have multiple functions, we have multiple products, so we need to allocate the buttons to only one function. How to do that? We learn from this course through simple examples and then more complicated examples how to tackle with the allocation. Uh, there are a number, number of uh, methods to tackle allocation, disaggregation, system expansion, and allocation by mass energy for economic value. What else is there? Uh, the next step is there, which is the life cycle impact assessment. Here in the first uh, or let's say second step, we are here, we have uh, our inventory, all data that we have are normalized to our functional unit. And then we have a pool of pollutants here, and we need to allocate this pool of pollutants to uh, impact categories, either midpoint categories or end product, product categories. Uh, two important steps here, classification and characterization, and optional steps like normalization and weighting. We are focusing uh, during the course on the important mandatory steps that we need to do here. Uh, important to learn that uh, LCIA is not new. LCA did not invent it. Scientists doing it for decades. Key, feature, uh, key features of uh, LCIA versus other framework is that we link everything to a particular function or to a particular product. Uh, LCIA give us the chance, the opportunity to see how the trade-offs are going. Maybe we have calculated many impacts, many environmental events. So we need to see if one impact increases, what is uh, what is going on with the other impact. Uh, a good thing to do is to use multiple LCIA, LCIA methods, especially for nanoparticles and nanomaterials. Uh, we do not need to choose a single LCIA method. There are many LCIA, uh, LCIA methods. Uh, and of course, the LCI method that you will choose should be aligned with inventory choices. The last part that we do is uh, uncertainty analysis. Uh, actually, we don't need any more uh, some deterministic LCA. We don't need deterministic results in LCA. We need to do some uncertainty analysis. We need to get some ranges out from our results. So use ranges for inputs to get ranges for outputs. This is very important. Uh, use multiple data sources to do that. And of course, sensitivity analysis always uh, always have trial and, trial and error, as Professor Harkid said, is not good, is not cheap. Uh, of up, uh, one factor at a time is better. Design of experiment is the best. Uh, and use data from various sources to generate probability distribution for inputs. So not only use ranges, which is good enough, but use probability distribution for inputs in order to get stochastic out. And this is my last uh, slide. Try to connect uh, everything that I told you with, uh, with LCA and uh, nanoparticles, nanomaterials, it's not easy. Uh, actually, you can find uh, a few number of papers that uh, do that, and uh, most of them have, uh, have problems, have problems. And these problems are related to uh, not set a proper functional unit that the LC study have been implemented. So someone that, uh, that does this kind of uh, study, nanomaterials and nanoparticles and an LCA analysis on these products need to uh, set a proper functional unit. Also, the system boundaries, they don't need to stop at the gate. 
it needs to go further at the youth phase and at the end of life phase for many reasons. One of them is that we need to get the improved the, the improved products and uh, the specification of these improved products into the youth phase of uh, of these enhanced products. And also, we need to do this. We need to collect the release, all the emissions from the release of the nanoparticles and the nanomaterials, which is very difficult somewhat to calculate or even estimate. So there are many problems. There are some LCIA models like the youth talks that we can uh, use. Uh, maybe we need to introduce new impact categories in order to assess the impact of the nanoparticles or use multiple uh, multiple LCIA models. And uh, of course, we can link the LCA to chemical risk assessment, always will help to increase our knowledge on this field. Uh, the big question is, what is the characterization factor for nanomaterials and nanoparticles? How to connect our inventory with some of our environmental impacts that we need to choose if we assess nanomaterials like freshwater ecotoxicity and human toxicity. That's all from my side. Uh, I will be open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Thank you. From the audience. Maybe from the audience Check that it. are Check connected on the app. I don't see it. Unless it's uh, just just clarification. If I understand right there, anyway, uh, there is a guide to to quantify the impact because impact till now is a questionnaire in in uh, in uh, the evaluation process. How can be evaluated? Uh, it's a, it's a general in description saying uh, big things, the ideas, but. It's not quantified. If LCA could uh, contribute to the impact, then impact concerning this part is is quantified. There are models. Somehow. Yes, there are models like the UTOX model that uh, I showed in the last uh, slide that they are trying to investigate or let's say better estimate which are the characterization factors in order to get the impact from the nanoparticles. But uh, still, uh, this is under uh, investigation because there are many problems uh, regarding uh, uh, the time of the, of the release, uh, the chemical characteristics, the physical characteristics of these of these materials. Questions that you know better than everybody is is difficult to, to get in uh, in impact assessment. And, and the whole picture. It's difficult to have the whole picture. Επειδή είστε πολύ φοιτητέ, η συνολική εικόνα έχει πολύ μεγάλη σημασία και θα σα πω κάτι για να το έχετε κατά νου τα ηλεκτρικά αυτοκίνητα, για παράδειγμα. Ε, γίνεται ξαφνικά τα τελευταία πέντε χρόνια, έχει γίνει μια στροφή και έχει αλλάξει αυτή την βιομηχανία. Μα αρέσει, δεν μα αρέσει. Αλλά σκεφτείτε τι βάρο έχουν οι μπαταρίε σε σχέση με το βάρο του υπολείπου αυτοκινήτου και τι ενέργεια χρειάζεται. Ε, προκειμένου κανεί να πάρει τα υλικά, ε, το mining ενώ το, την εξ, εξόριξη, ε, για να τα χρησιμοποιήσει για αυτά τα κιλά που είναι πάρα πολλά, που χρειάζεται ένα αυτοκίνητο για να κινηθεί 100% ηλεκτρικά. Τότε θα καταλάβετε τι εννοώ και υπάρχει, υπάρχει πραγματικά μεγάλο debate πόσο χρήσιμο είναι όλο αυτό. Αυτό ισχύει για όλες τις τεχνολογίες. Βέβαια, 
μέχρι να οριμάσει μια τεχνολογία χρειάζεται και αυτό το διάστημα. Όχι πάντα βέβαια. Uh, thank you very much, Ανέστη. Thank you, my dear. Uh, your uh, USB. So the next. Uh, your USB. Is a Vita, uh, but I know you. I have been confused with uh, Vaya and the Vita. Yes, that's the same. Okay, Vaya, thank you. Um, is a civil engineer uh, with master, first master on computational mechanics and the second master on analysis and design of structures. Um, Ms. Chotulidi has experienced both from the construction industry in Greece and the research field in uh, academic environment. She will present the recent advancement in the building industry and their connection to LCA. Vaya, thank you so much for being with us. She's a member of the group. Uh, I would like to thank you very much from my side. Uh, and to and I'm honored to be a part of this Nano uh, International Seminar uh, seminar. Uh, so hello from my side. Uh, I'm going to present you uh, LCA in the School of Civil Engineer. So uh, let's talk about um, um, a little th little things about life cycle assessment. Uh, uh, we will define um, the life cycle assessment, why it is required, how it is uh, performed, and uh, especially uh, we will talk about some cases uh, and we will show some cases uh, for the LCA of buildings. Uh, so uh, LCA is a systematic methodology used to evaluate environmental impacts associated with the product process or activity throughout its entire life cycle. Uh, from raw material extraction to end of life disposal, LCA takes into account all stages, including manufacturing, transportation, use and disposal. Uh, uh, so the life cycle phases of the LCA are illustrated as we can see in this figure. Um, it, it is assume, it assumed that the energy mix for heating, cooling, and air conditioning and electrical services, as well as the conduct of material replacement through renovations, will be the same of the, the entire lifespan of the building. Excuse me, yeah. give us one second to yeah. fix something for the presentation. Okay. Sorry yes. for the interruption. Okay. So, uh, as we can see, the first stage is the raw material acquisition. Then uh, it follows the material processing, uh, the manufacturing and assembly, uh, use and service, and also the retirement recovery, and lastly, the treatment disposal. Uh, so, uh, YLC is required. It is required for governmental regulatory barriers and certain objective goals and lack of tools. Uh, we have to measure our progress. Um, so, how is it done? A uh, goal and scope definition defines the purposes, audience, and system boundaries. Uh, we have the, uh, the first stage is goal and scope. Also, it follows the inventory analysis, LCI, the impact assessments, uh, where we can see what are the environmental, social, and economic um, uh, effects. Uh, and as for the interpretation, uh, uh, the, uh, we there are two sta three stages the ways to reduce environmental impacts uh, conclusions drawn from the study and the recommendations uh, so as for um, the life cycle assessment of buildings um, buildings became a major target uh, for environmental improvement as building sector accounted for nearly 40 percent of the world's energy consumptions uh, 30 percent of raw material use and 33 percent of the related global greenhouse gas emissions uh, so uh, we will talk about um, uh, the first study case uh, um, that we tried to solve. Uh, uh, here we can see um, from from a building um, a six story um, where it seems the parameters steel, cement, sand, uh, polyamide 
aluminum, steel, primary cause rock, um, and as we can see, all the other uh, uh, materials that they used for this analysis. So, uh, and uh, at, the right, at the left side, we can see the materials contributed 94.1% of initial embodied energy and 93.6% of life cycle embodied energy requirement. Also, also at the right side of the um, uh, of the diagram, uh, we can see that the materials contributed 99% of initial mass and 98.4% uh, of life cycle mass uh, requirements. Um, also, uh, here we can see the distribution of life cycle primary energy consumption, and uh, uh, as as far as the distributions of life cycle environmental burdens um, for this um, for material production, transportation, construction, HVAC, electrical, water services, uh, decommissioning is our concern. Uh, next, uh, we have. A uh, primary uh, 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 the first figure at the left, we can see the primary co constituents of global warming potential um, for the five uh, uh, impacts that are, I already referred. Uh, also, we can see um, it follows the primary constituents of nutri nutri uh, nutrification potential, uh, the primary con constituents of ozone depletion potential, the primary constituents of uh, acidification potential and the primary constituents of solid waste generation. Uh, now, as for the second case study, uh, here uh, the scope of this was the Sustainable Design Committees um, and the, of the four regional SCAOC member organization um, and the Sustainable Design Committee uh, are collaborating on a case study uh, on how, on how uh, LCA analysis can be used to quantify the relative environmental impacts of different structural um, seismic systems. Uh, there are five different um, uh, structural seismic systems. The first uh, phase uh, studies a prototype five story uh, where we, we will see the prototype and the design of this uh, building is a five story office building in LA to compare and compare the life cycle impacts um, uh, of five and then uh, of eight different structural system systems, including steel, concrete, masonry, timber, and hybrid solution. And uh, the LCA tool that is used for this um, uh, analysis and study uh, was the Athena Impact Estimator. Uh, the initial phase of study focuses on assessing relative impacts uh, of comparative um, uh, structural system for a proper prototype five-story office building in LA. Um, uh, Specifically, uh, ha it has to do with a comparative study uh, where we um, it utilizes pre pre preliminary schematic level structural designs generated by the regional um, SEAOC sustainable design committees uh, for the different structural system as a basis for the assessments. Um, these pre preliminary designs include primary vertical and lateral framing members and systems with allowances for applicable connection systems. Um, also, the design concludes uh, and includes foundations and slabs on crate, and the concrete and muscle structural sections include uh, reinforcing designs or quantity estimation. Uh, for the initial uh, phase of the study of non-structural systems, uh, each building um, has, uh, it has, has been assumed that includes a generic curtain wall system, single pie or equivalent roofing system, and dry wall covered core walls and ceilings. Uh, the last study is, in, is uh, under process uh, and uh, it has to do, um, and the study is in the process of uh, quantifying and assessing this architectural call and cell system using the Athena impact uh, estimator for comparison to the structural systems. Um, so the prototype uh, building description um, is um, shown here uh, it, and it has a generic pricing system. Uh, here we can see the typical office floor plan uh, and uh, the design criteria and loading assumptions. Um, 
So, so th this building is designed based on 2012 IBC and seismic hazard level associated with the site longitude and latitude. Uh, structural loading considerations has to do with uh, gravity loads, seismic loads and foundations. Um, here we can see that um, uh, uh, they are considered live loads as for, as for the office is concerned, uh, that, the, that the magnitude equals to 50 PSF, the partition loads, uh, which are th uh, two types of loads, the vertical and the lateral, and has 15 and 10 um, PSF um, as magnitudes, uh, the roof live loads, uh, and, the, and the dead loads, which has to do with the structural weight plus allowance for ceilings, flooring, and MEP systems. Uh, as for the seismic loads, um, it, it is design, designed and uh, based on the 12, 2012 uh, IBC seismic demands based on site location and site class D. And as for, uh, for the foundation, there are three types of uh, loadings. Uh, is the soil bearing, uh, the flying being friction, and it is considered uh, the passive pressure. Uh, these foundation bearing capacities are considered to be relatively uh, con conser conservative for a typical five-story office building. Um, this is a variable that can be adjusted in future phases of the study, and these relatively low bearing values result uh, in relatively large footings with relative uh, significant environmental impacts compared to the rest of the structure, particularly in comparison to the lower impact timber uh, buildings. So, uh, as for the uh, life cycle assessment tool that uh, utilized for this, um, for the purpose of this study, uh, uh, it was the Athena Impact Estimator, uh, developed specifically for application to buildings and intended to measure the full life cycle environmental impacts from cradle to grave. Um, it is available from the from the Athena Sustainable Materials Institute. Uh, it is um, uh, open source and it is free of charge. Uh, it is uh, intended by use for, uh, for use by design teams to explore the environmental footprint of different material choices and uh, current cell system options. Uh, it follows the ISO, the ISO uh, 14040 um, series. Um, Three, uh, more specifically, specifically, three times of ISO and the 2006A and the ISO 2006B. Standard LC procedures provide a user-friendly tool for performing the very complex task of assessing environmental impacts. Uh, it provides cradle to grave inventory profiles for whole buildings. Uh, so, in order to account the um, for all the energy and material flows from nature and the emissions back to air, land, and water. And also, the, um, um, as for the conceptual design tool, uh, it, it developed the comparative bills of materials uh, based on the building size and permits direct user input of a detailed bill of materials. Uh, they are calculated, um, in the environmental impacts that are calculated and based on its internal life cycle inventory, uh, database and reports has to do with the global warming potential, acidification potential, uh, smoke potential, ozone depletion potential, uh, eutrophication potential, fossil fuel consumption, and human health respiratory effects potential. Uh, here we can see um, uh, the slab plan of uh, which is, which the material that was used was concrete. The foundation plan and um, uh, the frame elevation uh, of this building, uh, the concrete SMF, and uh, uh, the concrete special moment frame design includes four two bay moment frames aligned allowed the perimeters of the building. Uh, typical floor and roof slabs uh, were designed as uh, 8 inches post-tension flat slabs. Uh, as we can see from the um, figures, uh, columns were designed as uniform, 24 inches square uh, and at all floors to, and to simplify the forming and, uh, per, and patching shear issues. Uh, the perimeter moment frames are supported on continuous grade beams and uh, uh, typical framing plans and foundation plans uh, uh, are followed. Uh, also, uh, the second uh, sub-test case that uh, it was used for the life cycle analysis uh, was the concrete CR wall. And also, we can see the framing plan, plan and the foundation plan. Uh, here, the CR wall was from concrete material. 
uh, includes three C-shaped sear walls of the core of the building. Um, typical floors and roof slabs, slabs were designed as eight uh, inches post tension flat slabs. Uh, columns were designed as uniform 24 um, uh, inches square uh, columns at all, at all floors. Uh, also, to simplify the forming and punching sear issues. <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, typical column footings are square spread footings uh, based on the 3000 PSF allowable soil bearing and the um, design dead and live loads. The c shaped sear walls uh, supported on three foot thick mat footings and we can, and we can see them uh, in two figures that are followed for the framing plan and foundation plan. Uh, the third sub test case was uh, the mas uh, masonry wall and concrete for floor system. Um, also, uh, we have the same lamp use. Uh, this masonry sear wall and concrete floor building design includes masonry core sear wall and eight inches post tension flat slabs at the roof and floors. Um, uh, it's the same procedure with the concrete buildings columns, uh, also designed with the same way. Um, and the loadings uh, was this, uh, was considered uh, the same. Uh, it has to do with the typical column foot footings uh, designed based on the 3000 PSF allowable soil bearing and the design dead and live loads. Um, and also we have the case of the masonry wall and steel floor system. Uh, here we can see um, that uh, the masonry sear wall and steel floor Building includes masonry core walls and steel and 6.25 inch composite metal deck floor and roof system similar to the steel building option. Uh, also, the columns are white flange sections. Um, typical column full footings are square spread footings, uh, also designed with the same uh, soil bearing load, uh, the same design loads and live loads. And, uh, uh, here we can see also the frame plan and foundation plan of this masonry and steel floor system. Uh, as the fourth steel spe special moment frame um, was developed to include four three bay moment frames aligned around the perimeter of the building. Uh, typical floors and roof systems were uh, designed as 6.25 inches composite decks over white flange composite steel beams and cheaters. Um, also, the columns has white flange sections, a step down in size of the third floor, and also we have the same uh, allowable soil bearing and design detail and live loads. And the perimeter moment frame columns are easily linked on the, at the foundation to a white flange section, section beam embedded. Now that is the um, differentiation that is embedded in a continuous concrete encasement and supported on spread footings at each column. Uh, furthermore, we have the steel buckling restraint braced frame. Um, uh, we can see a 3D configuration framing plan and foundation plan. Uh, the steel buckling restraint braced includes two single bay braced frames aligned at each perimeter side of the building. Typical floors and roof systems were designed with the same way as we already described. Uh, and the um, footings uh, are square spread footings designed um, based on the, de the, and the design uh, was based on the same load soil bearing and, um, and the dead and live loads. The perimeter braced frames are supported on great beams and um, also uh, we have the wood framed and uh, light timber with BRBF. Uh, the prim, uh, this is a preliminary um, test case. Uh, this test case uh, uh, includes eye joint uh, floor and roof systems, GLB beams and girders steel columns and steel BRBF lateral bracing systems. Uh, the BRBFs uh, were located around the um, perimeter of the building uh, with one frame uh, on each side. Uh, uh, typical column footings are square spread uh, designed based on the same loading um, soil bearing that load and live load. And also the perimeter of uh, BRBFs are supported on continuous grade beams around the perimeter. Uh, also, we have the case with the heavy timber with plywood sear walls for the wood frame. 
Um, as for the heavy timber building design, it uh, was utilized cross laminated under timber CLT uh, floor and roof systems with uh, uh, GLB beams and uh, girders, GLB columns, and plywood shear walls um, at the core area. Typical column footings are square spread footings designed based on the same uh, gain load, and the light frame. Course here bearing walls uh, are supported on a continuous mat grade beam. Uh, here we can see uh, the LCI inventory, uh, which has to do with the bill of material summaries. Uh, um, we can see the concrete SMX, concrete shear wall, masonry, uh, concrete, the steel, masonry and steel frame, uh, the steel SMF, the BRBF, timber light and the heavy. Uh, also, we can see the FDN seismic foundation, gravity systems, seismic framing increment, and all these uh, uh, slab on grade based on average with each, uh, WWF concrete over metal deck assumes uh, WWF. And um, also, uh, as for the Athena impact estimators, um, we found uh, that Athena impact estimator uh, to be generally very easy to use and powerful tool for comparative life cycle assessments. Uh, the um, uh, AIE material uh, categories and units were generally easy to match to our structural material takeoffs. Uh, output bill, bill of materials were easy to verify with our inputs of bills of materials, noting that the Athena makes percentages allow allowances for material waste resulting in slightly larger output quantitized than input quantitized. And on the other hand, uh, we found that Athena's internal structural modeler, uh, which permits a user to define the building geometry and structural system times, and then internally calculates the structural size and generate bills of materials, was not easy to use um, effectively. Uh, that's why it's under uh, progress. And we, uh, in fact, we had little success with this feature. Um, that's why um, Athena generated material quantities differed from our calculated quantities by, by factors of several times in some cases. Uh, also, this, uh, this result uh, it, also, it was also validated uh, by a previous study uh, that, had co that was conducted uh, in Chicago by Hal Crow Yoss um, um, that had more success, that's why it's under progress, using the internal structural modelers in that case, uh, but still reported significant discrepancies ranging from several percent to several hundred percent between the Athena generated bills of materials quantities and the manually generated quantities. As here are some results uh, where, can, where we can see from the different materials, the different sections that we utilized, uh, which has to do with the concrete masonry, steel and timber. Uh, as far as the global warming is concerned, the ozone depletion, uh, fossil fuel consumption, the smog potential, the acidification potential and eutrophication potential. Uh, also, uh, here we can see the human health criteria, uh, the impact intensities per square feet, uh, per, per square feet and um, some impact rankings. Uh, also, here we can see the impacts per structural component time. See, um, it has to do with the seismic loads, gravity, FDN uh, loads and FDN seismic loads. Uh, and also, we had the structural seismic component weights. Um, and as far as uh, as far as the conclusion is concerned, uh, we can conclude that the, um, uh, there is a growing attention for sustainability in the construction sector. Current regulatory frameworks are developed to facilitate the implementation uh, of the assessment of environmental performances. And despite some limitation of the CA technique, it is still a powerful and science-based tool to evaluate the environmental impacts. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Baila. Thank you for the presentation. Questions from the audience? I have a question to Baila. Okay. So. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. 
So thank you for the presentation and you you thank showed you. a lot of cases that are relevant to LCA and different tools that can be used in the construction sector. And this is uh, what's important also for nano air project. Uh, my thank question you. is related to the curriculum that uh, you had as a civil engineer. Uh, did you have uh, courses that were relevant to these tools and uh, that uh, you showed to us? Or it's something that the civil engineer needs to know by his own uh, by uh, personal yes. experience. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your question. Uh, it is an important. Um, it, it is very important to say that that um, uh, as civil engineer uh, at my undergrounded uh, courses, uh, there were no. Um, relative courses that had to do with the LCA and uh, there was only an optional uh, course and uh, if someone uh, would like to learn a lot about the LCA had to uh, had to um, to do a more personal work and had to do some uh, project if uh, um, he or she discussed with the supervisor professor. As a subject, there was no experience at my undergraduate studies. Uh, did I answer your question? Of course, and thank you for this because you give us a stepping stone uh, for nano air project in order to uh, include courses in all different uh, engineering fields that are relevant to this. Thank you very much, Valia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valia. So we can uh, go on with uh, Professor Paraskevi Karka. Now we have the two external invited speakers. Parastiv is assistant professor at the University of Groningen, Netherlands, in the Faculty of Science and Engineering in Sustainable Process Design. Her research interests include modeling, process design, and sustainability assessment, uh, also life cycle assessment and technology assessment of industrial processes, machine learning, industrial symbiosis circular economy and techno-economic assessment with particular emphasis on the development of uh, uh, light cellulosic bio and production of advanced biofuel fuels and bio-based chemicals. It's a whole paper you are uh, expert. I'll just say that I, recent, I was recently asked by the department of chemical engineering in the University of Groningen to design from scratch and teach, of course, and coordinate a new course that is called Advanced LCA. So I had to investigate what is around this advanced term. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Kostas Karadidis and his research team for their kind invitation. And I would like to share with you that this is a very great honor being here with all of you today. Uh, the, the presentation the presentation refers to life cycle assessment methodology with focus on early design stages and uh, with the term the term design refers to processes products and systems in general uh, we're going to see what are the bottlenecks and challenges when we try to apply life cycle assessment methodology, especially due, due to the fact that we need a high amount of information if we want to apply this methodology, and due to the fact that there, is, there are data gaps in the cases of uh, emerging te and innovative technologies. We're going to see why we have the need to shift towards alternative approaches of LCA that can be applied at early design stages and what is the role of machine learning techniques in their development. Finally, I'm going to show you some applications of these early stage assessment methodologies that have been already published in fields like petrochemical industries and bio-based industries. And I'm going to give you an expansion, a potential expansion of this concept for the case of building materials 
in order, in order to be consistent with the topic of this uh, workshop. Um, this is a home appliance, and as consumers, we try to buy energy efficient products according to what is indicated by this label. Okay? But for us, that we are as engineers and scientists, is this factor enough if we want to estimate the holistic environmental performance of this appliance or of uh, a system in general? Let's decompose this appliance in further components, and all of these components are made in their turn from various materials. Okay? And uh, these materials might be polymers, steel, etc. Let's focus on this ring. And this ring is made by PVC. And PVC, in order to be produced, uh, should be uh, we need ethylene, and ethylene can be uh, should be uh, converted to VCM. And this M should be polymerized in order to produce and take this PVC. If we want to estimate the holistic ass uh, uh, sustainability assessment of this appliance or identify the hotspots, for example, what are the most contributing parts of uh, during the production of this appliance, or redesign this appliance in order to make it better. We understand that we should repeat this procedure that we did for one material, for all of the materials and the components from which this appliance consists of. So we, we understand that the sustainability assessment of the system is much more complex than what we have designed, uh, um, thought once we bought this appliance or when we uh, use this appliance as consumers. And if we want to generalize this concept and make it in the framework of life cycle assessment, and uh, let's assume that this product is produced, the desired product is produced from a particular production process that is restricted in the particular system boundaries. But in order to make this production process functional, we need the various activities that take place outside of the system boundaries. And uh, they take place in the background system, as we say, in life cycle assessment. For example, in order to produce this appliance, we need raw materials and energy. But energy, for example, electricity, is produced somewhere else and outside of the system boundaries. And it, uh, electricity is responsible for its own environmental impacts that are produced outside, but indirectly attribute these impacts to the desired product. Life cycle assessment has to uh, come to widen this perspective and incorporate this concept in the whole life cycle chain, including in the analysis, the raw materials, extraction, preparation, production, the production process, the step that is the use phase, potential recycling or reuse of the components of the product that we have produced and the disposal of this is the, the return of the components of uh, the desired product at the end of its life cycle. We usually use two terms in life cycle assessment according to the analysis and the system boundaries that we select. The first one is called great credit gate. Once the analysis is uh, um, limited in the um, the boundaries that start from the raw materials preparation and we stop the analysis at the factor gate once we uh, just produce the desired product and the credit grade once our analysis includes the whole life cycle impacts uh, life cycle stages life cycle assessment is not a new methodology and has its roots in the decades of 60s and 70s with the first efforts of the industries to make to do the first energy analysis studies but the uh, the methodology in a standardized format was formulated the decades of 90s from the international standardization organization and it has four steps we saw that from the previous uh, speakers in the first one, we should answer one question, like, what is the system that we should uh, study? We, we would like to study. First of all, 
I would like to uh, assess the production process of a bio-based uh, polymer and compare it with a fossil-based one. Another uh, term, significant term, in the first step is the functional union. That this is the reference flow on the basis of which all of our an analysis um, refers to. For example, I want to estimate the production of uh, one megajoule of a bio-based fuel and compare it with uh, one megajoule of a fossil-based one. The second step is the quantitative includes the quantitative information of our system. This is nothing more than as engineers and scientists know that uh, when we um, create a system, this is the mass and energy balances combined, of course, with the uh, waste streams and then kind of emissions. In the third step of the analysis, we translate and convert the quantitative information into a wide range of environmental impacts. We translate the system flows in impacts such, such as climate change, eutrophication, acidification, fossil fuels, depletion, water footprint, and other similar. And the final one is the interpretation, where we uh, should uh, judge our results, identify hotspots, and redesign, probably uh, propose redesign actions for our system. Life cycle assessment is connected with a high amount of information that is needed in order to be implemented. And uh, we gather information from two levels of systems. This is called the foreground system, but this is the system that as engineers try to design or to redesign, if uh, we have this need, and the background system as well. This is the system that supplies our uh, uh, study system with flows such as chemicals, such as energy, and the main features. But we do not finalize the need of information here because let's say that we have to assess one product that is produced from two different pathways. And um, the need of collecting information in life cycle assessment is highly proportional the goal and scope, scope definition of our study. Because in this case, we should analyze, model, and assess an equivalent amount of pathways that are directed to the desired product. So you understand that according to the four steps of the methodology, the second one, that, is the, that this is the inventory analysis, is the most challenging part when we try to apply life cycle assessment. And here, this is the need, this is the focus of the particular lecture. And I, I'm going to present you why there's a need to go towards streamline and uh, uh, screening LC approaches. The, uh, this restriction of uh, finding information becomes much more difficult for the cases of emerging technologies where the information is highly limited, the uncertainty on the model is very high, and the upscaling of the emerging technology from lab scale to the full operation is also uncertain. But we have a benefit in the early stage um, scales of the process development of a process development uh, pipeline because you have high degrees of freedom in order to change from one the uh, design decision to another one and the costs to change this decision are very high so the question here is can we extract knowledge from existing technologies and identify those key aspects that can be available as early as possible in a process development pipeline in order to identify those factors that can affect the environmental performance of the process? And let's see what is the role of machine learning in order to achieve this type. There is 
proof of concept in these families of tools. And the first one of the first efforts by the literature was done in the Etaha in Zurich with the FANCAM tool. FANCAM tool was a tool that is able to predict LC metrics such as cumulative energy demand, climate change, with the only required information, the molecular structure of the desired product, the product that we want to assess. And this concept was applied for the case of petrochemical industries. A step forward was done with the development of the biochem tool that was transferred to the field, the domain of bio-based uh, processes. And uh, this concept was expanded, including not only the molecular descriptors as the input required information, but it was enriched with some process-specific input variables that were available um, easily available in early stages of process design. And this regression effort was uh, uh, performed um, in, in a satisfactory way. So the question here is, the basic idea is, can we use background and foreground information from selected and existing industrial sectors in order to train life cycle assessment models that are able to predict LC metrics such as climate change notification and other similar with the use of machine learning techniques such as artificial neural networks and classification trees. The benefit of uh, neural networks is that they can give us numerical results, estimations, the benefit of classification trees has to do that they can give us categorical results, class labels. And if we would like to express this concept in a mathematical formulation, the goal is to find the value of an LC metric, Y, for example, climate change indicator, and predict a function Y that correlates an LC metric, Y, with X, that is a set of decisions that are available at early design stages or large scale evidence. Uh, this concept should be trained, is applied for a particular training set, data set, and this uh, training data set consists of two parts the, um, the target attributes from the training set and the predictor variables x that should consist this function. Let's see how can we find this uh, target attributes in a particular training set. In order to predict and create this function, we go and collect information for the desired products and we can apply that for any kind of LCA indicator. For example, here I can provide you what has been tested in literature, and this can be these models have been already applied for 24 AC metrics that are provided by the recipe life cycle input assessment method. And let's go now and see how can we identify for the training of the, the models the predictor variables X, the basic principles to select and apply. This set of predictor variables is that they should be easily available on lab scale and conceptual process design levels. And this uh, set of predictor variables for the particular models have been inspired from literature, previous efforts that have been applied in green chemistry principles uh, uh, assessments, experience and testing from previous experience from the authors of this. Um, effort and experts' knowledge. Uh, we usually ask experimental groups or designers what information can be available and either published or via experiments. And let's see the application of those models in the case of bio-based products. These models, this concept has been already applied and published for the case of bio-based products. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the procedure, the uh, training procedure, consists of 
three steps. The first one is the preparation of the training set, the uh, predictor and the target attributes, the selection and the application of artificial neural networks, and the classification trees, and the evaluation of the results. And for the particular, for the particular um, applications, uh, um, a case of biomass to product for, uh, cases were selected, starting from a particular bio-based feedstock and ending to a particular bio-based material or biofuel. For example, uh, the, the particular training set consists of uh, chemical platforms or um, bio-based uh, materials such as PU elastomers or PF resins, for example. The predictor variables for the particular domain were inspired by the Fankin tool that consists of uh, the, uh, the description of the molecular structure of the desired products, the number of carbon atoms, the number of oxygen atoms, etc. And it is enriched with um, information that describes the particular pathway, especially uh, focusing on synthesis path oriented information information that is inspired by the green chemistry principles that are easily available in early design stages in the, during experiments, mass intensity, reaction mass efficiency, mass loss index, etc. Parameters that express the complexity of the pathway and other parameters that are chemistry oriented, for example, the maximum temperature reaction or the number of endothermic reactions in the production path and this information implies indirectly the energy requirements on scaled up cases of uh, uh, product cases. For the particular models, and in order to see if the particular training set should, can perform and develop uh, adequate models, uh, an iterative uh, cross validation procedure should be applied, and it was applied for the case of a bio based. Uh, processes and uh, for the evaluation of the results, statistical indicators such as the classification error, the sensitivity and specificity were applied. The same requirement and the same concept was applied for the case of artificial neural networks, applying as well, following as well an iterative procedure of cross validation, uh, testing the um, homogeneity of the um, validation and the training set as well for its uh, iteration, and also uh, statistical indicators such as in the, uh, coefficient of determination, Pearson coefficient, and root mean square error were also used in order to test the, um, the performance of the models and the prediction performance. Here I present you the result of uh, a classification model for the case of the climate change indicator for in a graphical representation. In order to use this model, first of all, we do not need the inventory analysis. The only requirement for someone, for a user of this model, is just to follow the pathways that the, the tree presents and just answer the questions of its node. For example, the first question here of this node is that I should answer that, for example, my product is produced by wood chips. The second question from the model is how many reactants, apart from air and water, are used in order to create your product during the particular pathway? If you want, have more than two reactants, and if you answer as well, how many endothermic reactants do you have along the production pathway, then you obtain the answer that the particular product has high climate change impacts expressed in kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of the desired product. And what do we mean with high? We mean that we can give a rough estimation that the particular product has uh, more, greater than three kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of product for the climate change indicator. The same concept can be, has all already been applied and published in a specific, in relevant uh, 
uh, papers, publications for all the 23 um, in, uh, indicators that are provided by the SCP lifecycle impact assessment method. I would also like to add that what is the, the use and the, the importance of uh, obtained such a result. It's enough, it is enough in early design stages to take rough estimations like that. So these tools do not replace the detailed NC analysis, but they help just to screen the promising options. Uh, regarding the results that have been tested for the case of neural networks, um, the particular effort gave um, adequate and satisfactory results, and for the coefficient of determination, for example, uh, we took results ranging from 0, 0.6 to 0.8, that is extremely higher compared to the first effort that was done in this field, the FANCAM tool, that was around 0.4. So the enrichment of uh, the, uh, the initial concept of the models that were based on the molecular structures uh, with um, easily obtained information from uh, uh, conceptual design stages was uh, 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 extremely helpful for the performance of the models. And let's see how can we apply and connect this concept in the domain in other domains and in the domain of building materials and constructions, and this is a concept of the particular workshop. And uh, let's assume that the term early stage in the domain of building materials refers to the preparation and the production of building materials. So let's focus and um, uh, specify our analysis on this level. The question here is how can we use these early stage um, methods, uh, tools, and um, let's select the classification trees for the particular domain and identify what, from which point and how these tools can help us in order to select sustainable materials or um, make priorities in order to redesign or make interventions in the building materials field. First of all, we need to train the classification tree. And how can we find this information? The information is available already for mature and existing processes for a wide range of building materials in the Convent database and in Simabro software. And uh, you can find there around more than uh, 700 uh, observations for this field. And 118 have been selected for the demonstration of the particular example. And this um, minimization of the, uh, of the data set compared to this uh, close to 1,000 uh, observations has to do with the fact that the Convent database has for a particular product, more than one models in order to model it. So, for the purposes of this demonstration, we selected processes that correspond to average European uh, cases. And from this information that can be found and is available in the Coinvent database, we can find information about the training set and, in particular, obtain the target variable Y of the models that we saw previously, especially for the climate change indicator. And let's see how can we create this classification tree for the climate change indicator. Apart from the target attributes that we can obtain it from the convent database, we need a set of potential and candidate critical parameters. We never know at the beginning uh, of a modeling procedure what is finally appropriate for the best modeling results, but we should start from something. So, a preliminary selection found in literature gave us that potential uh, critical parameters might be the source of the building material, might be organic or inorganic, the type of application, what is the use of the building envelope, 
binders, paints, covering, sealing, insulation, window and door uh, components, etc. The degree of innovation in the production process, uh, we can assume here that might be conventional or a product with an improved or modified production or properties, like recycled feedstock or green electricity. Degree of transformation, uh, uh, product might be, material might be um, natural or undergone, undergone uh, uh, um, a series of uh, transformations and then we can characterize it as synthetic and the energy intensity. And here I present you the result. This is the pre a preliminary model of a classification tree of building materials for the climate change indicator. And here you can see that, the, first of all, the model, according to the entropy minimization criterion, selects some of the critical parameters that finds important for them for the modeling. And um, the tree can give us a guidance on from which point we can preferably start and prioritize our analysis. And here, the tree shows that guide, gives a guidance that we can start from materials that have high climate change environmental impacts. This is the first remarkable example, at least from this preliminary uh, modeling. Another part, remarkable information from this tree, is that highlights uh, give us the importance of the energy the energy intensity parameter in order to be directed towards low or medium um, impact materials. Okay, this is a first estimation, this is a simplistic representation, but another important information that we can gather once we um, uh, once we try to interpret this analysis is the fact that in the case of innovations via mixing or composite incorporation of innovative and composite materials, there is a question here, can, how can we shift a final material and keep it to a particular class label? Once we try to do an innovative uh, action and create a new material, we should keep it at least marginally in one of the low or medium class labels. And the question from the, for the designer is, how can we keep this low impact performance of the new innovative and innovative materials? Concluding, I would like to repeat again that models do not intend to replace the detailed LCM models, but provide screening of candidate options, reduce the design space, save time and money if they, can, they are able to be applied in large scale uh, analysis. The concept has been demonstrated, published and verified for the case of petrochemical industries and biochemical industries, but the recent uh, literature shows the need in the life cycle assessment at early design stages for building materials. Machine learning techniques are highly dependent on the quality of training information and the quantity of codes as well. And these tools, of course, can be combined with other aspects of sustainability, such as the technology maturity and the economic dimensions. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. I think it's time for questions from the live or the online audience. And yes, please. Uh, thank you, Paras TV, for this uh, high-level uh, presentation. Uh, now, regarding nanomaterials, what is your uh, expectations in uh, combining nanomaterials with these uh, machine learning techniques? Yeah. First of all, I would like to say that I'm not a material 
time if possible. But uh, we try to give an answer regarding the knowledge extraction, modeling, and the ASA principle. So, first of all, in order to apply a new field, and this goes to every type of field that we go to in the like assessment and machine learning, we should know uh, the technological requirements of the domain that is called building materials. We usually start gaining experience as much as possible from mature cases. The benefit that machine learning gives to us, this type of models gives to us, is that decomposes any kind of uh, new material in some variables that are common in both cases. In the case, um, there is no, um, there is no distinction if uh, a material is called innovative or if it is called conventional. So if we try to create a domain and develop a model, at least and starting from the conventional cases and decompose what are the uh, critical uh, critical uh, variables that can express and uh, 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 and express and describe uh, the production pathway then we can incorporate the opportunity of of uh, modeling innovative materials so the only uncertain parameter by taking the same variables yes Exactly. It doesn't matter if the, if the material is called nanomaterial or something else, first of all. The only problem with these models is the fact that once we try and create the first modeling effort, we model the innovative materials without taking into account the scaled up challenges. So there is a, a space of uncertainty here. And uh, we model machine learning with the um, knowledge that we have now. Uh, there is another dimension that is called uh, this dynamic or technology um, dimensions that at least uh, at this uh, uh, moment, and as I have seen in literature, it has not been incorporated yet in machine learning and uh, incorporating the this aspect of scaling up and what is the uncertainty of scaling up in the uh, currently modeled uh, materials uh, so this is the a concept that we usually start uh, with in order to develop uh, a new uh, and innovative cases um, the other dimension is the fact that nanomaterials uh, are incorporated in specific mixes. So uh, we do not discuss only on the production of a nanomaterial, but what is the marginal mixing that is able to affect the performance of uh, uh, the mixing of the conventional and the uh, in other words, this is another dimension that someone should uh, consider if he wants to go and model towards this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Anything else? Nothing. I'm sure you know. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now our uh, last, the second, the last speaker, second external is Federico, Federico Bruno. Um, he is a material scientist attending his PhD in innovation for the circular economy in the University of Torino in collaboration with uh, Centro Research uh, Centro uh, the research uh, field. It is the research and development company of Stellantis Group. Stellantis Group that collects uh, many brands in automotive, for instance, P Fiat, Peugeot, Citroën, Ram, Jeep, uh, DS, Peugeot, Citroën, uh, and many others. I will buy it. <laughs> for less than 15 brands. Federico uh, is being with us last almost six months. Yes, think, uh, since July. 
part of the his PhD in uh, machine learning and uh, nanomechanical properties and also LCA. Um, he is expert in, in um, uh, LCA, LCC, source of LCA in combination with digital, uh, digital tools. And uh, he considers uh, the circular economy and sustainability aspects. So that is something very important. It, it, it's a special leader for our group also. Uh, Ed, please. Thank you, Professor Costa, for the invitation. And uh, thank you for uh, your attendance uh, here today. So today we spent a couple of words about uh, impact reporting of uh, LCA, in particular in PCR and uh, EPD. And today I will explain uh, uh, quickly the complementary tools that often are used in the couple of life cycle assessment in order to improve the know-how about the sustainability of processes and many other things. Today I will spend a couple of words about georeferencing, social network analysis, material flow analysis, and the material selection. So Life cycle assessment follow the normative ISO 140444. This one is the, is the more uh, last updated, is uh, the 2021. That is uh, the approval of the first version of this normative uh, by the, since the 2006. Uh, this one is the classical schema that describes the normative, is something like a graphical abstract of, the, of this uh, normative. We have the goal and scope definition, inventory analysis, impact assessment, and then we have the interpretation. That is something like the discussion part in the articles. Um, okay. So, the first problem regarding the life cycle assessment is that the life cycle assessment often is used to compare uh, environmental impacts of the processes or, for instance, of, of uh, suppliers. But uh, to compare the data, it is necessary that this data must be originated from the same, uh, using the same boundary conditions, okay? And uh, in order uh, to overcome this problem, communities created PCR. PCR is the acronym for Product Category Rules, which provides the instruction to perform life cycle assessment for a product or service. In this document, we find uh, information on system boundaries, functional unit that is very important to define uh, the life cycle assessment, subject and definition in fact, is to be assessed. Okay? For instance, in the building sector, there are more or less 70 PCRs about uh, different uh, materials, different applications, uh, and uh, so on. The next step is to create the EPD, the Environmental Product Declaration, wherein it is mandatory to report the PCR code. Okay, PCR is a, something like a PDF, PDF document that describes uh, the uh, system boundaries and so on. EPD is a standardized document wherein the life cycle assessment outcomes are shown and discussed using uh, the, as reference the PCR. And moreover, all information requested by PCR chosen are reported. Okay. In this case, uh, you can compare the life cycle assessment outcomes of different EPDs that use the same PCR code. Okay. So now I will focus on the complementary tools. As I told before, today I will focus on uh, georeferencing, material flow analysis, social network analysis, and material selection. For instance, uh, some applications about this method regarding the supply chain management. Okay, in particular, now we the critical, the, the hot topic is the critical raw material supply management. Okay. And the supply chain management is linked with the enterprise risks, okay? In the prior risk means that uh, there are many risks, for instance, the poor risk, uh, a transitional risk, uh, low risk, uh, and uh, other type of risk. That uh, is very important to, to, force, to uh, solve the, the problematic about, for instance, the management of materials, the purchasing of materials from ethical resources, okay? For instance, uh, 
I'm uh, talking about the cobalt problem, about uh, the ethical purchasing of uh, cobalt used, for instance, in automotive field, in the battery electric vehicles. And, and finally, the technology, the technology improvement regarding to find the best compromise between performance and sustainability, taking into account sustainability, in sustainability belongs many different types of sustainabilities. We have the environmental sustainability that is the most important and measured with the life cycle assessment, but we have other type of sustainabilities, for instance, economical sustainability measured by life cycle costing and social sustainability measured by the social life cycle assessment or the social organization life cycle assessment. Okay, so georeferencing. Today I bring uh, some uh, building examples of the building sector. The first one regarding the earthquakes in the Indian area. Okay, I created this map used the software ArcMap. ArcMap is a paper used software about the GIS. The GIS is the Acronym for Georeferential Information System. In this case, we have the map where we have the countries here. It's not the point, laser point here, no. This one, okay. We have the countries and the Greek regions. And the, the colored dots describe the magnitude of earthquakes happened between the 1967 to 2017. Okay. How is possible to create this map? So the first the first step regarding to set the baseline map or more baseline maps. Okay, for instance, as we have two baseline maps, we have the, the baseline, baseline map about the countries close to Aegean Sea and the map of Greek regions close to, to Aegean Sea. Okay, so the next step regarding to select the attributes. Okay, in this case, we have many types of different attributes. The most important attribute is the shape because shape describes what is the object from a geometrical point of view. For instance, the regions and the countries are described by polygons, okay, because, because polygons describe areas. Instead, the dots describe the precise position identified by a precise value of latitude and longitude. Then another type of article is very important is the datum. Datum is a set of mathematician equations that describe uniquely the position of uh, a place, okay? For instance, the most common datum is the WGS 84. And finally, we have values, okay? In this case, we have numbers, but we can have also boost values and uh, strings. In this case, I, I, chose, the, I chose the uh, earthquakes uh, values, okay? In this case, we have numbers and uh, the color describes the range of the earthquakes magnitude, okay? But you can perform other type of data elaboration, okay, using the presented tools inside, inside the software, for instance, to calculate the central position, or for instance, to calculate the length of the routes, the length of the railways, roads, and many other things. And in particular, you can create the customized tools using Python coding because uh, often the GIS software support the Python coding to create new tools in order to satisfy your needs. The next one is a social network analysis. So social network analysis is not related with the social, the common social network, okay? But uh, social network analysis is a method uh, that uh, exploits the graph uh, theory, that is a mathematician theory, and uh, uh, consists to see and study the relationship between uh, objects. Objects, I mean, uh, uh, person, uh, stakeholders, uh, or many other type uh, of population. In this case, uh, I show the uh, network about uh, the construction tools interaction during the building construction. Okay. In this case, uh, there's uh, 
There's an ethos uh, bring, uh, brought, about, brought out by the social network analysis of for construction queues, that is the articles. In this case, we have uh, two networks. The first one describes uh, the interactions between uh, the stakeholders, the construction queues during uh, a week uh, of building construction. And the second one is the severity that describes the uh, the, the task shared between the construction crews during one week. Okay. To create the social network analysis, we have some steps. The first step consists to create a data set. In the social network analysis, the data set is a matrix called the adjacent matrix. In adjacent matrix is defined the nodes. Okay. Nodes, I mean, for instance, here we have a painting, electrical, mechanical, CD, inspection, and so on. Vectors and uh, links. Okay. So, after to have uh, the final uh, networks, you can perform some data elaboration type. The first one consists to implement the spatial algorithms in order to rearrange the network to underline some features. For instance, uh, exists an algorithm called open order that consists to underline the clusters inside the network. Okay. And then we have uh, other tools that allow us to calculate many interested features inside the network. For instance, centrality. Centrality is very important in network analysis. So the next one is the material flow analysis. Okay. Material flow analysis often is depicted by the Sankey diagram. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, I show the material, the material flow analysis uh, of uh, the residential building stock at the Rio de Janeiro, that is the article reported in the bottom. In this case, we have the flow of materials for the entire, entire life cycle of the construction site. So we have the uh, the materials, stock, the use of materials, and the end of life of materials, demolition, and the final destination of waste. The material flow analysis share many common points with the social network analysis. In fact, it's possible to, uh, to translate a network in material flow analysis and vice versa, using, the, using some type of software. Uh, in this case, uh, you can perform also the data elaboration, for instance, to, to, to find some bottlenecks in your material flow analysis, or, for instance, you can couple this type of analysis with the operative research. Operative research is a branch of mat mathematics that consists to solve the maximum and the minimum problems using linear programming. Okay? And this allows to optimize the material flow analysis, to optimize the flow, to minimize the cost, and it's very interesting, this one. Finally, we have material selection. So, material selection is a huge uh, uh, word. You have, we have uh, some different algorithms and some uh, different methods, for instance, quality function deployment, analytical hierarchy process, that is the, the best to use. In this case, I will show the Granta uh, views. Okay, Granta is a software developed by ANSYS that exploits the concept of ASPI map. Okay, ASPI map is the Cartesian map wherein the mechanical features are put in relationship between each other. Okay, in this case, we have the plot of year strength and fatigue strength. And uh, in the bottom, we have here strength versus the ductility. The greater, bubble, the greater bubbles describe the class of materials, whereas uh, the small bubbles describe materials or the subclasses of material. Okay? The best materials uh, will be the materials that uh, is able to start satisfy your needs. Okay? Because in this case, you can put uh, some thresholds and uh, the overlapping of the thresholds. Uh, Okay, we create the, uh, the conditions and the constraints for the material choice, and then you can choose the best materials for you. But uh, today, I will focus on uh, the ECODIT tool. Okay, ECODIT allows to 
perform a pseudo life cycle assessment inside the Granta software. Okay, so the I'm done, the I'm not consists to replace life cycle assessment, but the, the final aim of this tool consists to shrink the number of Madrigas candidates. Okay, in order to save many times when the life cycle assessment will be performed. Okay, in, in uh, Echo Audit, uh, we have different sections. The first section regarding the components, in this case, I assumed to use the austenitic stainless steels to create uh, steel rebars. Okay, using uh, and the end of life consists to recycle the 90% in weight of this material. Then uh, about the joining, uh, I choose the uh, well, the arc weldings in order to weld uh, the steel rebars to create the skeleton of your building. Finally, we have transport regarding uh, how we like to uh, transport the materials, for instance, from warehouse uh, to the construction site. In this case, I assume to use the truck. And finally, the use. Okay. So when you finish to fill up this form, you can click on summary chart and you have uh, this histogram as in output. The type of output are the carbon, the carbon footprint and the energy consumption. In this case, uh, to create one ton of steel rebar, I have to produce uh, almost four tons of, uh, of carbon equivalent carbon dioxide. Okay. But if I recycle at least the 90% of the steel, I can save two tons of uh, equivalent carbon dioxide. And so the net value will be two tons of carbon, equivalent carbon dioxide to produce one ton of steel reverse using the austenitic stainless steel. Uh, okay, so my, my speech is almost finished. The conclusions are, the first one consists in multidisciplinarity. The life cycle assessment, but in general, the sustainability is a multidisciplinarity topic, okay? For instance, in my PhD, is involved in different departments, for instance, the Department of Economy, the Department of Chemistry, the Department of Law, the Department of Politics, the Department of Agriculture, many different departments. We have uh, at least eight or nine departments involved in this uh, PhD program. And uh, it's very important because uh, in sustainability is necessary the scientific background, for instance, material science, chemistry, and so on. But also it's very important the economy, the economical background in order, for instance, to understand the feasibility of the process that the scientists perform. And uh, also the social science. Social science is very important in sustainability because now the ethical sustainability is a very hot topic overall for the companies, okay? Because uh, the companies, uh, in particular the greater companies, uh, every one, two years must be published the sustainability report. And sustainability report is very important to uh, divulgate uh, the ethical, uh, uh, the, the, the ethical uh, performance inside the company from direct and indirect point of view. Okay. And finally, the research and standardization of new protocols to set up life cycle studies. This one is very important because the data mining is one of the of, is the most so the most problem regarding to create the life cycle assessment because it's quite difficult to find the data. Okay, and in particular the affordable data to perform life cycle assessment. For instance, it is necessary to perform some standardization of the measurement. Okay, for instance, let me assume that I have an industry that, that produces some gas emissions, and I have to create, for instance, I don't know, a standard that exploit, I don't know, the FTIR or the GCMS instrument in order to obtain the data about the emissions and take this data in order to put inside the life cycle assessment life cycle assessment doing the inventory analysis okay it's very important to connect the instruments to measure for instance the gas emission with the life cycle inventory is very important this uh, this one and for instance ict 
is uh, very is very useful to to make this uh, work. Okay, so my my speech is finished. This, this is the, my contact, the my academical uh, uh, mail, and if you have any question, I will be welcome. Thank you very much. Questions, please? Yes? Thank you for the presentation. Your microphone, if you want. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask you if uh, do you believe that the next decades we are going to go towards social lifecycle LCA databases social life cycle impact assessment methods but how the network and social network analysis is going to help towards this this direction and how do you, and if you if yes how do you believe that these dimensions can be quantified via social network analysis yes thank you thank you for the question so the social network analysis can help to perform the social life cycle inventory analysis okay from the social point of view obviously the problem regarding the data mining because the companies tend to keep secret their suppliers okay because to create uh, I don't know, the, from supply chain point of view, exists a different uh, type of supply chain. We have the direct supply chain, the extended supply chain that considers the first neighbor uh, suppliers, and the ultimate supply chain that, cons that consists to have the all entire suppliers inside the network, okay? And uh, in this case, such a network analysis uh, is a good, can be used to perform a so social life cycle inventory analysis, if and only if you have uh, good data about, for, provided by suppliers, uh, this one is uh, quite challenging to have the data about the social issue about the, um, the companies. But uh, uh, regarding social life cycle uh, assessment, uh, many improvements uh, are ongoing. For instance, uh, some years uh, ago, is uh, created the first social product declaration from Itachi. Okay, and uh, social that is uh, the EPD from a social point of view, and obviously the, the the relative PCR. Okay, but in this case, uh, to many companies invest in this uh, in this direction in social life cycle assessment in order to mitigate uh, the uh, the reputational enterprise risk. Okay, is very important this one. But uh, the uh, answer is uh, yes, but uh, the data mining remain the mainly uh, constraint. The case of confidentiality was existing once the first life cycle assessment models like CIMAPRO and CoInvent. It was in yes, the past. I... There is one point there that this is the average. The production of average information. It's, yes, uh, for instance, exists uh, a type of uh, database uh, similar to Echo Invent, but uh, for social science, that is called PSILCA, mm -hmm. is uh, Echo Invent, but uh, the inventory regarding only the social science. Okay? You have the indicators, uh, exist, uh, I, if I remember right, 30,000 uh, processes. Uh, the processes are, are uh, all georeferenced, okay? Uh, for instance, you have, I don't know, uh, Greece, and for every Greek commodities, you have the inventory about the social point of view. For instance, Psyrka is a part is a paper used, and uh, so that is the most complete database that I, I know. Exist other database, but is smaller than the first one. So, I could take the second question without asking. Not okay. Anything else? Okay, let me summarize in one minute. I know you are tired. Thank you, Federico.
So I think that we managed to inform um, an active part of our community on nanoair and uh, nanoair objectives. Uh, the second is that um, we present uh, our activities as 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 a lab and uh, to to nanoair people and also uh, Irini. Uh, present uh, in detail one study case that is nanomaterials for uh, cement use based composites. Uh, then we had uh, we, you had a, a full picture of the curricula in chemical engineering department and also in uh, civil engineering department, or sorry, schools. Uh, then uh, Paraskevi and um, Federico um, discussed the uh, importance of early design stages, and then Federico, the importance of um, complementary tools. Um, I would like to thank you all of you being uh, with us here live, and also people uh, from from uh, distance. And thank you all our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I was just writing in the chat. You may enjoy the closing ceremony with some desserts and coffee at your uh, outside the room. And sorry, we can hear you just a minute. Okay. Yes, Kate. Uh, just to thank also from my side and to uh, wish everyone to enjoy. Uh, the closing ceremony with some deserts and coffee outside the room. Yeah, the, the people are informed here. Perfect. And please do not forget yes. to answer the surveys about the outcome of today's seminar. Thank you very much, all. For all participants, both for uh, the online participants and the physical ones, Certificates will be shared and for the online participants. We will send an online survey to complete and after the completion, you will get uh, the certificate. Yes, thank you very much, Kate.
Ακούτε. Έχω μείνει συνδεδεμένη γιατί απαντάω κάποια πράγματα.